just give me a sec guys, I'm something very important here, I'm putting a timer on. Aaron said, Aaron said no, no more than 20 minutes. Uh, and there is something called the fear of man. There's also something called the fear of woman. And my wife's helping with the children, she said, Matt, keep it short, I don't want to be there all night. So uh, I'm just going to share a little bit about the start of Calvary Chapel Maidstone. And there's a couple of different people that could tell different stories. This is my story, so from my point of view. I became a Christian in uh, 1991 uh, at the age of 16. So while you do the math to work out how old I am, uh, I'll tell you that uh, around about 1993, so a couple of years later, the Lord first started to speak to me that uh, he was calling me to be a pastor. And uh, move on so, uh, 10, 11 years, 2004, um, I was going along to a, a small Assemblies of God church and uh, I was invited to join the leadership, an elder as it were. And it just so happened that in the same year I went to see a guy speak called Andrew Robinson and he was giving a talk about how God is looking for shepherds. And it really hit me hard that the Lord is looking for shepherds. You might know the word pastor, the word name, the word pastor means shepherd, people to look after and care for the sheep. And that's when the Lord really made it abundantly clear that's what he wanted for me. The point is, I didn't much like that idea. I didn't like the idea of having a title. I didn't like the idea of being up the front and being in charge and having that kind of responsibility placed upon me. So I was kind of avoiding it and one thing kind of being involved in the leadership, another thing kind of taking on that kind of responsibility. Anyway, move on another 10 years, I'm still Elder Matt, uh, and um, I'm married at that point, and my wife and I happen to bump into Andrew Robinson again, and we're having a very serious conversation with him, and he challenges me, and says, you know Matt, God's put a calling upon your life to be a pastor. Are you gonna pick up that calling and, and move in it? And the thing is, we were a very small church, and we taught the Word of God, um, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, small assemblies of God church. Um, but when the role of pastor comes with an anointing, it's an anointing certainly to be a teacher, but also there is something else that God gives you that he gives you insight into people's lives and the word that you bring speaks into people's lives. And that's what I was scared of. Because I knew if I started to following the leading of the Holy Spirit and start teaching the things that he was telling me to teach, it would touch and challenge people's lives and that could potentially send up a hornet's nest and that's what I was scared about. But after meeting Andrew and him challenging me about this, and my wife encouraged me, saying that I want my life to mean something, to count for something. Um, I took that step forward. And instead of just playing it safe with what I was teaching, I started to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and obey God's voice and start to share and to teach the things that I knew that he wanted me to teach. And I was right, it did start to stir up a hornet's nest because as I started to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Lord started to put his finger upon different issues in people's lives. And they didn't like that. They didn't like being challenged, they didn't like convicted, being convicted and uh, so it meant they had to do something about it. But what I wasn't expecting is that as I started to follow God's leading and move out in that calling, it would bring to the surface sin in people's lives, sin that was hidden. And Abby and I, my wife and I, knew that we had to make a stand on some issues. And as a result of making a stand on those issues, it tore the church in half. And people who had been my brothers and sisters in Christ for 20 years stopped being my, my friends, stopped fellowshipping with them, and I lost a tremendous amount of fellowship. And the fellowship started to really go down to very small numbers. And we weren't very big to start off anyway. Um, through my wife, um, I'd become friends with Debbie and Dan Arnold. And I remember it was round about that time, we went for a walk around Trosley Country Park, and you'd just been called to go over to Bristol to pick up the work there. And I seem to remember you saying, you don't know that there's much of the work there, to be honest with you. In fact, you're only sure of one person at the moment. And when he said that to me, 
I felt the Lord say to me, Matt, you're going to have a congregation of one. And um, I didn't like to hear that. I just thought that was maybe just my imagination. But sure enough, six months later, everybody else that was a part of the church had left, apart from this little old lady called Mary, who was 70, almost 80. But I knew God had called me to that church, and I knew I had to carry on ministering in that church. And um, uh, so every week you're preparing this sermon, going along to a rackety old late 50s building that's leaking and not in very good condition and desperately need a repair, sharing a sermon and um, giving her a lift home at the end and saying, oh, how did you find the service this morning? Did the Lord speak to you about anything? And she goes, oh, I don't really remember anything you said, to be honest with you. <laughs> That was tough. I mean, that was, that was seriously very tough. Um, and, uh, but the Lord had got me in that place and I knew that's where I had to be and the Lord hadn't freed me. And so you carry on week in, week out and, and it, was, it was not much fun. Um, and uh, God blessed us. There's a lady called Kate who joined us about a year or so later. And uh, Kate and my wife got together praying faithfully every Thursday, Lord, please give us a vision. Please show us the way forward. Please, can you show us what to do about this building? That is just, we've got no money to be able to do it. Don't know what to do with it. It's more of a burden than anything else. And show us the way forward. And uh, carried on. And I remember about a year later, came in one New Year's, uh, first, the first service of the New Year, and the water main broke. And it was just water everywhere. I mean, you're walking, you're walking through it to, uh, over your feet and all the rest of it. And the children were like, hey, it's raining inside. And I was just sinking inside because it was just going from bad to worse. Um, this building that we couldn't maintain was just falling around around my ears. And it just felt as if it was a picture of everything else that was falling down around my ears. And um, so we, we, moved, we, we just closed the door of the building and walked away. And we started meeting in our living room, Mary, Kate, my wife and I and our children. And um, kept on praying, Lord, please show us what to do with this building. Please give us a vision. Show us the way forward. Just, this doesn't make any sense. But I hadn't had the freedom in my spirit to, to walk away, to, 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 to stop the, the, the church. And so there was a, basically a three-year period where this was all going on. They were three years of wilderness, three years of pain and hurt. I thank you so much for your fellowship, Dan. I mean, you, the support and encouragement that you and Debbie gave us was just incredible. And I've got to also mention Barry Forder in uh, Calvary Chapel, Portsmouth. Um, he and Barry, uh, Barry and uh, Joy would come and visit us regularly. We'd spend time together. And it was just encouraging. Um, and then after the three years, uh, one Monday, I'm a plumber. And I just happened to go home at lunchtime because the job I was doing was near our house. And Abby came running out to me with a phone and saying, there's somebody on the phone who's interested in the church building, which begged belief because I can't believe anybody would want that building. And um, I spoke to the person. There's a church called Kent Pentecostal Church. It's a group of Christians, all from the Kerala region of India. They were looking for a place to meet and wondered whether this building might be available. And I thought to myself, well, you know, it might be... It might, it might be suitable for them and I'd much rather be used for the glory of God than not used at all. So we met, so that was on Monday. On the Thursday, um, met up with uh, the pastor, Pastor Anand, and a few of his other elders and showed them around the building and thinking, I don't know what you want this thing for. But they were, they were looking at it and they were, you could see the eyes getting wide and they were getting excited. And I should say that about two months beforehand, um, Kate had had a picture of the church building with a bow wrapped around it and we didn't know what this uh, picture meant and the danger with pictures is that instead of waiting for God to give you the interpretation you place your own interpretation upon it and I was thinking are you saying this building is a gift from you Lord and because we're meeting in our living room and not meeting in the church building we're somehow in sin or something like that and I was really confused and so we just kind of put it to one side Anyway, 
I shook the hand of this guy, Pastor Anand, and the moment I shook his hand, you know sometimes you just meet people and it's like spirit touches spirit, there's an instantly a, a connection with a person. That was the case with this guy. And um, the picture came back to mind. And I just felt the Lord saying, Matt, this building's a gift and I want you to give it to this person. And so the long and short of it is after our meeting, just handed him the keys for the building and that's now theirs. Um, but now we're a church of just a couple of people, don't even have a church building now. And what are you doing, Lord? We still need a vision. We still need a way forward. It was, uh, it was tough. And, um, and we went to, and um, that Sunday, the following Sunday, so it was Monday, Thursday, then Sunday, I was teaching from 2 Corinthians, um, a chapter chapter 5 and when I got to verse 17 it says therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation old things have passed away behold all things have become new and I was talking about how when you become a Christian your old life dies and new life comes forward or uh, you know you are a new creation the old things have passed away new, and behold all things have become new but it's not just a one in a once in a lifetime experience that happens when you're born again it's an ongoing experience your past continues to die and get taken away and new things continue to get birthed and then i for some reason i said and there's a time for a work of god to start and there's a time for a work of god to end it's time for something to begin and something to pass away and I believe it's time for this work, this is little Assemblies of God Church, to, to die, to pass away, for us to close the doors. And so that morning I, I said that the church had come to an end and I felt freedom to put down what I'd been struggling with for three years. That evening we went along to this Kent Pentecostal church because you're thinking, well, maybe this is our future. We'll join in with these people. Maybe that's where God wants us to belong. And we had a lovely time of fellowship with them, lovely born again fellows knew that we'd given a church building to the right people but at the same time I knew that um, that wasn't the church building for us that wasn't the church for us to belong to and so it came to Sunday evening and I was I was not in the best of places to be honest with you because I'd lost my church I'd lost my brothers and sisters in Christ lost the building didn't have a home it was a Two people that I was talking to on a Sunday morning, one who couldn't remember anything I said, and still no vision for the way forward. And Abby had gone to bed, I'd stayed up late watching some junk on TV, and um, I remember just thinking in my heart, well, we'll just carry on meeting in our living room, and maybe if the Lord is gracious, he'll add one or two people to us. Um, maybe there's another church for us to join. And, and if I'm lucky, I'll get a home group and I can maybe do some teaching then. Um, and I remember going to bed that night and I was walking up the stairs. And as I got to the top of the stairs, as clear as a bell, the Lord said to me, Matt, your vision's too small. Calvary Chapel Maidstone, spirit-led, word-based. And it absolutely blew me away. For two reasons. I completely dismissed Calvary Chapel as a possibility in my mind. It, I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a proper church. And that's something special, something else. And that's not me. And the other thing is I don't want to move to Maidstone. <laughs> um, and after the shock, there was excitement. And then there was the fear of how do you do something like this? I don't know how to plant a church. Can I plant a church? Do they want me to have a Calvary Chapel? I don't know how does that work. And so this was in the December, and a couple of weeks, now about a week later, I'd gone, it was Christmas, I was going down to Abby's parents in Portsmouth, and I went to see Barry Forder, uh, pastor at Calvary Chapel, Portsmouth, Christmas Eve, and I sort of said, uh, I went to see him, and I said, Look, Barry, I'll, 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 I'll be up front with you, is there any chance I could start a Calvary Chapel in Maidstone? And he said, of course there is, Matt. And he gave me every encouragement you could possibly want and he put me in touch with Steve and I don't know quite what Steve made of me to start off with. I think he was a bit sceptical, a bit suspicious, which I don't blame him. Um, and for the next six months or so, myself, my wife 
Abby uh, and uh, Kate and Mary, we were praying for the Lord to show us the way forward. And there were a couple of things we needed. We needed somebody to help us lead worship. And I really needed some, a guy to come alongside me in the work, a kind of second in command, if you like. Um, and so we were praying about this, praying for the way forward, to show us what to do, and that the Lord would add these people to us. And I know that in the interim, uh, a lady called Hannah and her husband, Johnny, were looking for a church. Um, they'd struggled to find a church that they both liked and agreed upon. Hannah toured with musicals and so forth, and the only church that she'd ever been along to that Johnny liked was uh, Calvary Chapel. So she contacted Steve and asked, is there any chance you could plant a Calvary Chapel in Maystown, at which point you'd have my phone number or email or whatever it was, and you put her in contact with me. And so we met on uh, a Sunday evening, and uh, she had a long list of questions that she'd asked various churches that she'd gone to, and all of them had been pretty much failed where these questions are concerned. And then she starts asking me all these questions, and I'm giving her all the answers that she likes, the doctrinal positions, where we stand upon the end times, what we believe about creation, where do we stand upon Israel, and so forth. And she was getting more and more excited with the whole thing. And the thing is, she's a professional uh, musician and singer. He's a professional musician and music leader and a music teacher. And they've got a burden to lead worship. And so right there that evening, July the 8th, um, I shook hands with Johnny and we said, OK, right, Calvary Chapel Maystone starts tonight. And they lead the worship today. Two days later, I met with Hannah's father and mother, Ian and Francis. And the Lord had making, it was starting to make them feel very uncomfortable in the church that they were in because of various things that being teach, being taught. But they didn't yet know that God was preparing them to move to somewhere else. And as we were talking to them, there was just that real connection, that feeling that God was bringing us together. And in fact, uh, Ian had been done some ad hoc teaching for Shoreline Calvary Chapel for uh, Tony Holiday, PT. Um, and he'd been saying, you know, you should be starting a Calvary Chapel in Maidstone. And he's like, oh, the thing is, I don't feel like a leader, I feel more like a second in command. And that's exactly what we've been praying for and looking for. And uh, so we had a lovely time of fellowship. And you know how you're looking for common ground, just as confirmation that God has brought you together. And so there's that common ground that he's got some exposure with Calvary Chapel. In fact, he's got better exposure to me because he's taught in a Calvary Chapel. I hadn't. And um, uh, we found that we both had got, got our core basic Bible understanding from a teacher called Roger Price, who was a Bible teacher with a tape ministry out of Chichester Christian Fellowship. He's passed away, been with the Lord now. But what that means is we've got the base, same basic uh, theological background and we've got a shorthand when we talk about things of God because we both exposed this same teacher. We both homeschooled our children um, and uh, we had the same point of agreement on every point of doctrine, not a single point of disagreement at all. It was just incredible the connection that God placed between us and um, just before they were leaving just came up that uh, Francis uh, grew up in Paddock Wood, which is where I grew up, which was a nice kind of little cherry on the top of the cake. And so you just sort of ask, oh, where, where about some Paddock Wood did you grow up? And she goes, oh, well, I grew up in Laxton Gardens. And I'm like, no way. I grew up in Laxton Gardens. Which number did you live in? And she goes, oh, I lived in number 30. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I grew up in number 30, Laxton Gardens as well. And my parents had bought the house of her parents. So we played in the same garden, swung on the same scene, climbed the same tree, slept in the same bedroom, would you believe? And, you know, you don't build a church on that, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of those little things you just know that God's been preparing for a long time, what he wants to do in Maidstone, this church. And so um, we started meeting in our living room and uh, we're getting a few people, Lord, so to add a few people to us to a point where um, it got to, just got to the place where it was too many people, we couldn't fit, and a week later we moved to Maidstone to a much bigger living room. Of course, COVID struck, so we had to go online, and the Lord added to our number when we were online, 
And then afterwards, the Lord has led us to a lovely church hall where we've been meeting for, I don't know, a year and a half, two years, something like that. And so we're five years old. The Lord's blessed and added to our number, and it's, um, it's deeply encouraging. But I wanted to close with just one verse. Because it, it's not, it wasn't an easy journey. I had to lose pretty much everything. I had to lose friends, I had to lose a church, I had to lose all hope really. Um, and it crushed me. It absolutely killed me inside. And it reminds me very much of uh, John 12 verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And I had to die to everything before the Lord could bring, bring something new in. It's not only the church had to die, I had to die as well. And I just want to say this in closing. If you're going through a difficult time, if you're suffering loss, if you feel as if things are being taken away from you, if you're suffering and hurting, know that God is doing a work in your heart so that part of you dies, but the reason part of you is is dying is because he wants to bring forth more fruit and it might be difficult now but the blessings that come afterwards make it more than worthwhile amen thank you